Hey, Amanda, welcome to Keep What You Earn. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Oh, God, so glad to be here. Really, really excited for this conversation. Me too. I I was interested in this because I had, I mean, there were so many different things that had kind of popped up in my brain recently on, you know, how much it matters to talk about like our lived experience in our careers, especially as a woman in accounting and finance. And I've told a few of these stories before recently in person and someone actually came up to me and they were like, you really need to tell these on the podcast. Like you need to share this. And I said, you know what? Not only me, but other people do too. And we were chatting and I was like, I got to have, like, let's, let's have this conversation. Let's chat a little bit about our lived experiences, but let's talk about what it's like to be women in our industry. And in order to do that, I want to introduce you. Could you just give everybody listening a little bit of background on your career and what you do? Adams. I live in Texas. I'm a CPA here in Texas. Um, if you can't tell by all the Texas decor in my background, <laughs> um, super proud Red Raider fan. Um, went to Texas Tech and got my master's degree. I am a mom and a wife and a dog mom. And you'll hear all about my career um, throughout the episode. So I don't want to give too much away right now. Mm -hmm. But that's just a little bit about me, a little piece of me. Now you're a fellow business owner as well, right? You have, you run your own practice. That is right. It's got a very unique name, Amanda Adams CPA. Um, Texas has some requirements. You you have to use your name. So yeah, Amanda Adams CPA. Awesome. And who do you serve as clients? I serve small. And when I say small businesses, I serve small businesses anywhere from 20, 30,000 up to five, 10 million. Um, I like working with the smaller individuals. I love professional services and am most known in the construction industry. Um, that's kind of my bread and butter. I'm married to a contractor, so it works for us. I love it. And once I learned that too, I was like, oh, this is going to be real good because we're going to talk about all of the things about being a woman in finance, especially in these industries. So let's dig into it. Um, did you ever work in in big four or like the bigger firms? So I interned in big four mm -hmm. in Dallas. I am in West Texas. So Dallas is like five hours away from me. And we considered moving our entire family there. When I graduated, I interned and got an offer there. Um, however, I got in a wreck my very first day in Dallas. And... I had kids who were older. I was a non-traditional student. I have kids who are older and were getting ready to start learning to drive. And I thought there's no way I could teach them to drive in Dallas. And so we stayed put where we are. Okay. So, I mean, even interning there, it, it's an experience. I think once you've gotten exposure to big four, it's just like, it's something you really can't replace or explain to anybody else. You agree? I completely agree. It is... So I can, this sounds so silly. And when I was interviewing for my internships, I remember asking one of the big four, like, what time does everybody come into the office? And they were like, oh, whenever you want. And I was like, wait, what? 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 I was like, no, no, no. Like, when does everybody come into the office? And they were like, oh, you know, whenever you want. And I was like, I'm still not understanding that comment. Yeah. What do you mean whenever I want? And they were like, well, some people come in really early to avoid traffic. Some people come in mid-morning to avoid traffic. Some people come in afternoons and they stay till two o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, so how will I know when I need to be at work to work with the people? Like, what? <laughs> and so... That was my biggest confusion going into the big four, just to throw that out there. Um, there were no office times per se. And I was like, that's what yeah. you get used to. Yeah, I think it was different for me. Now, was that recent that you were? Um, 2018. 2018. Okay. I interned in 2008. So it was 10 years earlier, right? And that difference is like, I was in a big city. And we would show up and they were like, business hours are 8.30 to 5 or whatever it was, right? Eight, like everyone came in at 8.30-ish. And 
eight thirty till you're done is what they meant. So eight thirty was roughly like the call time. If you were later than that, it was kind of like a, mm, especially if you walked in with coffee. Um, but mm-hmm. you had to make it in there in time. You had to be on time. But there was this unsung thing, especially for like the younger classes. I have so many questions now too. Like there's this unsung thing that like the younger classes would, um, you couldn't go home until the senior went home. Like you couldn't be, it was like the lower on the totem pole you were, which is totally politically incorrect for me to say, but the lower on the rankings you were, you were expected to stay later. It's almost like you couldn't be the first one to go home, God forbid, as the staff won. You had to wait until the manager left. And I don't even know where that started, but looking back on this, this feels so silly. I think it does sound silly. I think it's kind of though the same battle that we talk about a lot right now with COVID and work from home and appearances. I think, Mm. you know, they say, if you want to get promoted, you have to be in office because out of sight, out of mind. And I think sort of that it's the same philosophy. You had to be there. You had to be showing them that you were showing up and you were willing to go the extra mile. And that's something that I really do differently. I want the flexibility and I want to be able to work from home and I want to be able to work the hours that work with my family. Um, I'll never forget earlier this year, I was going to say last year, but it was this year I was working with a firm and they got really upset that I left in the middle of the day to go to my son's high school class ring ceremony. It was during tax season and I expect you. And I was like, it's not like I can't take a lunch. I mean, like it's, I literally live two miles from the school. Um, it, but he was presenting me with his ring Um, in the ceremony, they present their parents with their placeholder rings. And I was like, I'm not missing that. I don't care that it's in March. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, So that philosophy, we've still got some, a way to go on that one. Well, even the comment, I'm sorry. No, (laughs) no. Like that's just, that's just it. That drives me insane. But we, we, we touched on this a little bit. I want to talk about image uh, for Mm -hmm. a second. The importance of image when you work at an, uh, I say an accounting firm, this is our lived experience, but it could be any corporate entity. It could be any sort of job that you're in, but the importance of image and how that's emphasized uniquely for women as well. I cannot tell you how many conversations I have had about what I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. And and can we measure how long her dress is? Is it long enough? Um, It flares out at the bottom. Does that meet dress code? Do we count from where it flares out on her leg or do we count from where it hits at the bottom? Um, I I, I could go on. Are jeans acceptable? Are sweaters acceptable? Is that business casual? Is, do we have to be in a suit? Do we, so yeah. many things. I this is one that like really gets me because yes. I'm like, can I do my jobs, my job in a pair of ripped jeans? Because I can. Uh, Evidently, we can all do it in joggers and sweatpants for the last two years. So hey, here we are. It's so funny the 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 split there, and I agree with you. And I I go back to you know what's so funny is that until provoked, I wouldn't have remembered this because it was just part of life, right? Like we, we accepted all this as truth, right? And it became part of our, our, our routine. So for example, I didn't own a pair of peep toe heels from 2008 to 2014. Why? Because they were not part of dress code. You could not show peep toe, one and a half toes, right? You couldn't show that on, on your heels. They had to be covered, had to be like full coverage. Um, when I first started, tights were a thing. When I first started, that was 08. That's nearly 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, that's different. But like, again, the times, right? This was, this was appropriate in the times. This was not unique to my company. But I'm looking back on this going, they told us what types of shoes we could wear. 
men had like zero guidelines. I feel like other than like collared shirt maybe, but like with women, it was kind of like you had to have like your nails had to look nice. You had to wear, um, there was a certain neckline. There was a certain skirt height, um, some type of, what do you call those? Hosiery and your shoes. Oh my goodness. I had, um, I had an incident where I walked into my, I lived in the city, right? Walk into how many times have you walked around the city and seen women in like a pantsuit hosiery and sneakers because we had to walk from the train station. I could not be caught dead. I had to hide around a corner and change my shoes and put them in my bag. Just because you could not, you couldn't be human and need to wear comfortable shoes. Correct. You, okay. I, I'm going to try to one up you real fast. Okay. Go for it. First time I, n I didn't wear any makeup into the office. First time. Amanda, you look really sick. And I was like, no, I have really bad allergies. And sometimes I just need a break. And so I said, no, actually, my allergies are just really bad. I don't need to put anything in my eyes because I rub them, they itch. And I can't wear makeup right now. It really is just I'm not wearing makeup. And they were like, no, no, no. You look really deathly sick. And I was like, thank you so much for that. I feel fine. <laughs> it's really interesting, too, because it's a lot of it is how it's delivered. Because if someone said the dress code is like, you must wear heels in the office, like you can't wear those sneakers. I understood that because like once I crossed that threshold, I was like, I have an image to maintain and this is the dress code. And I respect that. But the, the degree of like the fear I had of, well, where am I going to change my shoes? I've changed on the subway and risk twisting my ankle up the subway stairs because <laughs> I hated wearing heels. But like those types of things or, or wearing makeup, right? And like looking a certain way, I think there was an added level. Uh, and this isn't just to complain about the work environments and stuff like that. This was a different time for us. And it's, it's a really interesting take on like, you guys don't know how many things go through our heads, mm -hmm. like how many stressors we have outside of the actual work that just showing up to work and wearing the right thing, saying the right thing, looking the right way was already consuming so many calories of our brain that, I mean, no wonder we were exhausted, right? And having to buy a new pair of shoes and hoping that you don't get um, some sort of blister or some, what if it doesn't fit the right way? Like, oh, I love these shoes. Oh my gosh, these are the worst shoes I've ever worn in my entire life. Yeah. Um, it, it really is, I, I've had that conversation. So I have two teenage boys, a husband, I have a teenage daughter too, but my boys, these are the conversations we're having. Guys, y'all don't even know what it's like to be a female who has to do more than get out of bed, do this to their hair and brush their teeth and throw on yesterday's sweatpants. <laughs> it's much different. It is. And I think, and I want to talk about this too. Like, at the time, that was totally normal. At the time, it didn't phase me, didn't bother me. This was just, this was the expectation. This was part of the routine. And looking back on it, and I think those of you listening can relate to this if you've ever gone through this too. It's like, yeah, that was normal because that was our normal. Like I was happy. If you ask me, was I happy working at the firm? 100% I was happy. 100%. I loved working there. Um, I felt great. I felt powerful. I felt important. I, I learned a ton. Um, but then there's these elements where you just remember this and go, wow, I also did all that. Uh, do you agree? Do you find the same type of experience of, I wouldn't tolerate that today, but I wasn't unhappy then. 2020. Right. I think that this is one of those things, and I want your take on this too. Yeah. We evolve as we go, right? right? So as we change companies, as we get further in our career, we evolve as people. We evolve in our knowledge, our experiences. But if we don't ever take that knowledge back and it never comes full circle, how do we make the change? Mm -hmm. So like, you know better now, you'd never tolerate it now or in your business. I would not either. But anywhere where those things were tolerated before, who's coming in and, and saying, 
hey, this this is not what the new normal is. I think it's I think it's implicit through generational changes. I think there is a degree of that. Like there's a difference in expectation now. I think going to school in, I went to school in 04 to 08. We graduated 08. The second week at the firm, Lehman went under. Okay. That was, we were the last class of the abundant time. Like, mm-hmm. and by that, I mean, we were the last incoming class at my firm of 24 people. The next incoming class was nine people. Oh, wow. We had, th- we had three rounds of layoffs my first year. I think culturally, when we have three rounds of layoffs your first year, culturally, what you've done is you're, you're managing by fear. And because of that, we were so lucky just to work there. And we were so grateful for every, blessed for every day we could walk through those walls, walk through that marble hallway and clack our heels. Like I was grateful every day. And if it meant I have to go hide in a corner to change my shoes, so be it. And I think that's what masked it. Oh, I agree. I agree with the, you're very lucky. That is a mindset shift I'm really having to work on. Um, Not that anybody is lucky to have me per se. I don't think that I'm the biggest, the best, Um, but they are lucky to work with me. I do bring something very, very valuable to the table And I think that's one of the greatest things I've seen in this pandemic is the shift in hiring. And I know it's kind of wavering back and forth between employee, employer, who's in power in the hiring environment. And I'm so grateful that I worked for myself. Um, But I think that one of the best things to come out of that though has been people who come in and say i'm no longer lucky to have a job yes this is a two-way street anybody that i work with whether it's in an employee employer relationship or contractually through my business i'm going no this is two-way you get something from me and I get something from you. If we're not in agreement on what that looks like, this doesn't work. Yeah. We were not taught to, we were not taught or encouraged to articulate our own value at all. It was a, it was the, like how lucky we were to work there. And again, different time, economically, culturally, everything. And they were not wrong because we were very grateful. Grateful is one thing. We were very grateful for the opportunity in front of us because we knew that this was going to be a major opportunity for our careers. Yes. But I think when you exploit that in the name of, okay, well, we can get them to do nearly anything because we know that this is a good opportunity for you and a good name on your resume, that's where it takes a turn when you exploit it in the name of it, because that's where that's where stuff started to started to take a turn and expectations were just completely unrealistic, but with no benchmark to go off of no point of reference for a lot of these, I say kids, then they will tolerate it as though it's normal. And I think that's where we all start our careers kind of hazing a fraternity. We don't know we're ha- getting hazed in like we're pledging a fraternity and getting hazed. And I didn't realize it. No, a hundred percent. In I think that that's why I'm so outspoken about things because Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not my responsibility, but my, I, how do I say that in a nice way? It's, I want to do it. I want to tell people, women, men, children, like there is a different way. It can be different. I, I really enjoy being able to be that voice that says Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be this way. And I don't just mean in women in accounting. I mean, when I'm talking to my business owners, hey, guys, I know that you are stressed and I know that you are wearing 800 hats and you are overwhelmed and you can't take a vacation and you it doesn't have to be that way. Right. Like it is a great joy, privilege, privilege is the word that I was looking for. It is a great joy and privilege for me to be able to be that voice. Love that. And I want to talk about power dynamic because you hinted at that. So 
the power dynamic. Um, and, and here's the interesting thing. A lot of people point to, you know, masculine, feminine, whatever it may be, the genders of the people in power. I think it's kind of this weird, it, it's, for me, it's easy to associate, you know, masculine and feminine with like the power structure. But I think it's also circumstantial because we were talking about this a little before we hit record. Um, my, I say my class because in big four, you're kind of like, it's like boy meets world where you like all graduate and then you end up in the same, same mm -hmm. school again. So my class of incoming interns that became staff, my class was 24, roughly 16 were women. Six years later, there was one left, me. Uh -uh. That means something because nearly all the men were still there. Many of them are still there. Nearly my whole class right now are partners. You know, shout out to any of y'all who know me. And many of them are partners. Good, good on them. Kudos. Happy for you. And what's so interesting is I just noticed this power dynamic when I was there that it was like one woman partner and maybe eight men. And it was this very strange dynamic that everybody had where it was definitely a boys club. You couldn't deny that. But like, not that opportunities were explicitly limited, but it was very subtle. What was your experience with that? It's been the same all throughout my career. So I, I looked up statistics. Of course, I'm an accountant. Of course you did. I, I looked up statistics. While accounting has moved into a more woman dominated industry that has shifted in the last several generations, only 27% of women make it to principal or partner. And so I think that lots of things are a boys club. And I think that sometimes we're graciously given a seat at the table. Um, I have been in many companies where I've had a seat at the table and I appreciate having a seat at the table. But I think that one of the things that we don't talk about enough in society and in general is that a lot of times women are so responsible for many of the things outside of just their jobs. So childbearing, raising, um, every Christmas party, every Christmas play, every Valentine's party, you know, all of the things that we can go back to the conversation out of sight, out of mind, and the women don't appear to be as dedicated. They don't appear to be in the office as much. And I think it really holds us back in our careers. If you work as a mom, you're told that you're failing as a mother, right? But if you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a failing career woman. Men are not held to that same standard, just generally speaking. No. Um, and so I think that with all of the side experiences that we have, we just aren't given the opportunity as much. I think so too. But I think, I think it goes both ways too, where it's not that they were, it's not that the women were kicked out. If you look at how, how it progressed from my six, six years at the company, the women were not kicked out. They willingly left. They were not told to leave. There is never any explicit, this is not the place for you type of conversation. The problem is that it becomes competing priorities and forced choices where it's those micro actions. Like you said, it's the side eye when you go to your, your son's ring ceremony. It's those little things. And for me, it was getting a phone call on my bereavement leave, asking an asinine question. Mm -hmm. And it was the little things that showed disrespect to the other priorities of the employee, whether that be a woman or a man. And I think, I honestly think that women have a lower tolerance for those things as well. I, do, I think that we have this sensitivity to those things. And we also care a lot about value alignment where for me, I left the firm because I found a values misalignment that was very blatant in that 
you guys are never going to support me the way I've supported you. You guys will never do me a solid the way I did for you. This is totally out of alignment for me in terms of what I'm giving and what I'm receiving. And therefore I must leave. Um, because I want to give myself to my career. But if you're not willing to reciprocate that energy for me, I'm out. And I realized the hard way that that was never going to happen. But I realized it early enough to leave before I made partner. Um, but for everyone, that experience is different. But I do think that there's a degree of women having enough of an intuition to know that, oh, this is not a good use of my energy. Because one thing we're really good at, to your point, is being project managers and time managers of our lives and our households. And we're going, ooh, that's going to throw a wrench in like my whole life if I continue this because this is not healthy. And I think we, re we recognize that a lot sooner. Do you agree? I... It's funny because I was looking through some old messages, text messages on my phone like last week and realized how many seven o'clock, 830 text messages I was getting at night, five o'clock yeah. a.m., you know, and I was just like, oh, my goodness. And this is several years ago. I was looking at old, old messages. Honestly, I was looking for something in particular, but I was just amazed at how intrusive that became and how it was just an expectation. Yeah. My kids knew if the phone rang, they would ask, is it so-and-so? Do you have to take that? Mm -hmm. And, and like, the phone ringing is one thing too. Like that's also marking of the time. Like it's a lot different now. I think with God, we were on Blackberries back then. <laughs> Okay, but Blackberries were like the phone back then. They were, but they were also the work phone that you could like put down and could be physically separated from, although you would probably get hell for it the next day if you walked away for too long. Uh, they were literally the shackle to your desk. I remember working remote for a period of time after I left the firm. I worked for another consulting company. I was afraid to go grocery shopping in the middle of the day mm -hmm. at the risk of what if someone needs something and I don't have my internet connection and I can't, and it was like, no joke, three blocks away. I could walk down to the store. I could be back in 20 minutes. I was afraid to leave for 20 minutes at the risk that someone would catch me. And I was like, I am imprisoned. Like I. Okay. I had that experience <laughs> yesterday. What if a client calls me and I'm not at my computer on a Thursday afternoon, I'm at Home Depot picking up a tool that I need for a project I'm doing at my house. No joke. Had that same. I'm self-employed. And I, <laughs> let the me guilt. be clear. The guilt. That the guilt. That you are not a constantly available should someone need you. Yes. The no. guilt we have for clients to be available because we, and, and, and I'm wondering where that comes from because it's a people pleasing thing for sure. I'll acknowledge that. But I, but like, I've never had, this is the hilarious part. Amanda, have you had this happen to you? Like have, has that actually happened where like you walked out for 20 minutes, you went out for an hour, a client emailed you and they were mad. You didn't respond in that time frame. No, never. No. Why are we scared of this? What is this weird monster under the bed complex we have that there's like this, that we're going to get our asses chewed out if we walk away for five minutes, even as self-employed people? Because Lord knows I have those instincts. Because we were taught, it was ingrained in us, um, that we're thankful to have a job. We're thankful to have clients. We're thank and we are. Um, but yeah, if we're not available from... 8.30 to 5, Monday through Friday. Oh my goodness, there was a holiday. How dare you have taken an extended leave with your family and not told me ahead of time. We're afraid of what that looks like. We, mm -hmm. we all hear horror stories. I mean, heck, we're discussing a few horror stories on here. Um, I think that we forget sometimes that those horror stories are outliers. They're not the day to day. Right. And we are just so afraid of that outlier. They're also the most vivid memories. Oh, because they're traumatizing. Yes. And that's one of the things, like I always say, we remember the negative. It's why Yelp reviews are always a friggin' paragraph 
long when they're bad and they're two sentences when they're good. And it, there's a reason because we have vivid memories of the negative impacts of things. We have vivid memories of the, of what happens to us when bad things happen. Not when the good things happen, we're like, good, that was nice. And we operate in, from a place of seeking pleasure, but that pain will stick with you. And that's why I remember all these things from the company I worked for. Lord knows I worked there for over six years, guys. And I can think of eight or nine incidents of things that were really bad that happened. It's not bad. <laughs> that's like, you know, one, one plus per year. You know, it's not enough to quit a job, but it is enough to remember and to formulate a lot of behaviors around. Psychology behind this, like it takes seven good things to negate one bad thing or something. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't find that surprising at all if that were the case. Like there's a psych psychological study out there. I don't know the exact numbers, but like it makes sense to me. Like it really, yeah. for every negative thing, you have to have so many positive to kind of wash it away. And it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. So for those of you listening who have had a similar experience, I'm curious, like, I really want to get this out there. I want you to share with us, you know, if you're on social media, share with me, DM me at keep what you earn or at Shannon K Weinstein, come find me. And I want to hear your version of this. Send me an audio note, send me a voice note, send me a, a, a DM and let me know if you've experienced any of this stuff, especially if you've worked in areas like finance or some of these, you know, we'll say more male centric uh, industries, because I think this is a really interesting conversation that we're going to continue on the next episode.